When the Visigoths under Alaric sacked Rome in 410 CE, the Roman world was stunned. Well, most of the world was stunned. If our sources are to be believed, when the Emperor Honorius was informed that Rome had fallen, he began to weep uncontrollably. When he realized that the messenger was referring to the ancient capital of his empire, which had not fallen in nearly a millennium, rather than his pet chicken named Rome, he calmed down. During discussions of how and why the Roman Empire in the West collapsed during the 5th century, the conduct of the Emperor Honorius is almost always treated as a perfect example of weak leadership and poor decision making spurred on by petty courtiers and eunuchs. Given what most of our sources say about him, it is sometimes hard to see him as anything more than a man-child who wiled away his time chasing pet chickens around his palace. Our sources and modern scholars tend to regard a good emperor as someone who takes the field in person, courts danger, and leads his people to a clear-cut battlefield victory in the mold of Alexander the Great or Trajan. Honorius resided in swampy, isolated Bravenna rather than the historical capital of Rome or the imperial forward base at Milan. He rarely left Ravenna and never led an army in person. For these reasons, it seems that most scholars have been content to accept the portrayal of Honorius as a hapless failure at face value. However, I recently encountered a survey textbook re-examining and attempting to rehabilitate Honorius' policies. Unlike most scholars who see Honorius as an incompetent palace prince, Roger Collins sees Honorius' actions as constituting a unified strategy, including his controversial decision to execute Stilicho. My discovery of Collins' argument on this matter is what prompted me to make a video on Honorius sooner rather than later. I mean, the chicken story guaranteed that I would have to talk about this guy sooner or later, right? Collins argues that Honorius' passivity in Ravenna was actually a wise strategy since it put the pressure on Alaric to win a battle and find a suitable base with sufficient supplies. In Collins' view, Honorius and his advisors learned some of the lessons of the last decades of the 4th century where barbarian invaders were unable to win sieges against fortifications and stocked granaries, but always had a puncher's chance in an open battle. Of course, Rome was famously sacked in 410, but by then the city had no professional military units and the city's defenses were neither modern nor in particularly good repair. As for the infamous execution of Stilicho, Collins justifies that decision by pointing to the establishment of military dictators in the East who made and unmade emperors. By eliminating Stilicho, Honorius got rid of the one man who would have been capable of establishing such a dictatorship which, in the long run, may have been more beneficial than preserving an experienced general-in-chief. In the end, Collins' argument works backward from the results to establish a rationale for the actions and events leading up to that point. This is how Collins is able to discuss Alaric taking Rome twice, sacking the city in 410, and setting up a rival emperor in that city at one point, but still not see these developments as policy failures on Honorius' part, since Alaric was never able to establish a permanent hold in Italy. I find the underlying logic in this argument to be unsatisfactory. While I personally think that Collins is giving Honorius far too much credit for having a coherent, comprehensive strategy, I do like the fact that he tries to create an explanation for Honorius's grand strategy that is more nuanced than, THAT GUY WAS AN IDIOT! In my view, Honorius was more attentive to his duties than he appears in the sources, but he was not someone with any real foresight or ability. The execution of Stilicho may have partly stemmed from a fear of military dictatorship, as Collins suggests, but this fear could have been what inspired the intrigue that the ancient sources attribute to more base motives like cowardice and jealousy. Further, Stilicho's deployment of the army prior to the freezing of the Rhine, while an understandable decision given the climatic instability and limited weather projection abilities of the 5th century, could have been interpreted as betrayal or incompetence by Honorius and his advisors, particularly if there was already tension in that relationship. Collins is probably right that Honorius and his handlers thought that the best way to contain Alaric 
was to force him to strike at either Rome or Ravenna, where the lack of siege equipment and provisions would potentially cripple the Visigothic attack or result in a Roman victory. To say that this strategy succeeded in the face of what actually happened, however, is absurd. When Rome negotiated with Alaric, they gave him the provisions that he needed to linger in Italy. While Alaric, Alaric's puppet emperor was unsuccessful in gaining the allegiance of many people, the notion that Honorius' successful diplomacy froze out Alaric's candidate ignores the fact that there was a lot of anti-Visigothic prejudice and the notion of serving a Visigothic puppet was highly unappealing to most Romans. The biggest flaw with Colin's analysis, which is shared by some of the harsh critics of Honorius, is that he doesn't consider that Honorius' policy toward Alaric was formed at a time when the Romans had very few options since the entire Western Empire was under attack and Stilicho had shifted the bulk of the army away from central Italy before he had been executed. Fighting openly was not really a legitimate option for Honorius, even if he had his father Theodosius' military skills, since he simply did not have an adequate military or financial base from which to wage an in-depth war against the Visigoths. In conclusion, I think that Honorius' personal shortcomings made life harder than it had to be for the Romans, but that even a much abler man would have most likely failed had he been thrust into Honorius' shoes from 408 onwards.